Located in south central British Columbia in the Okanagan Valley, the West Bank First Nation is one of seven native communities that are members of the Okanagan Nation. The West Bank First Nation is comprised of five reserves, two of them bordering Okanagan Lake in close proximity to the city of Kelowna, one of the fastest growing cities in British Columbia. Okanagan Lake is also home to Nahahait, a lake serpent of Okanagan origin commonly referred to as Ogopogo. Today, the territory stretches from Vernon down into Washington State. 150 years of British Columbia history is cause for celebration and reflection. A vital component to the Okanagan people in connecting to their cultural past is the practice of oral tradition, specifically oral stories. It is through these stories that many of their traditional and cultural practices, which were adversely affected by colonization, have been maintained. Through the years, Okanagan women have played key roles in preserving these practices, including the Okanagan language. Elizabeth and her daughter Roxanne are both members of the West Bank First Nation. They identify themselves as being traditionally Okanagan, which means that they have knowledge of and follow the traditional practices of the old Okanagan culture. They agreed to share their stories of what it means to be traditionally Okanagan and their belief that the Okanagan culture was and will always be tied to the land. Elizabeth is fluent in the Okanagan language and is recognized in her community as a strong leader. She is considered one of the most knowledgeable elders and has opened ceremonies and other public gatherings with prayers, drumming and singing in the Okanagan language. She has a great sense of humor and loves to tease. She can make small children and hulking Not men melt today. with her smile. <laughs> she is profoundly honest and straightforward, never afraid to speak her mind, and yet there is a humbleness that always counteracts her stronger opinions. Elizabeth believes that the Okanagan language and traditional practice drawn from the old Okanagan culture should be revitalized, maintained, and that youth should be taught these ways by elders. In our lives, in our time, different times, like the old culture comes back in the name ceremony for our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. That's part of the old culture. You don't just sit there and talk to people and somebody says, oh, well, this is, this is my, my, uh, my grandmother's Indian name and, or my grandfather or my granduncle's Indian name. And the next thing, oh, that family's got that name. It's happened right there. That's why I don't tell nobody my Indian name because I'm really stingy with it. But for the kids, the, their names, like we secured with a blanket here. Nobody can take it. Well, that's a law. But if somebody comes and, and says, oh, I heard they had a name ceremony. This is what uh, they call that girl or boy. You know, and if they take it, then it surfaces, people will know that they just took it. You know, they didn't pay for it. This is the family that has these names. This is the family that has hummingbird, morning dove, uh, Louis Gray ghost. You know, it's Papa Ochin, um, Natasuichin, 
those old names, one son named after his dad. So they called them the little campground. My son Hannah, his son. Now, by this time, old campground passed away. So now my son became the big campground. So now that name automatically goes to his son and his son becomes little campground. So it just goes down. Yeah. So I, I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Old culture, too, it covers um, um, the, the, old, the old grandma and grandpas or the, the uncles, the dads, mostly, mothers, aunts. They uh, take their young, young ones with instructions from their elder, just like my mom did with me. My grandfather told her what to do. So that's what she did. She took, listened to my grandfather, and um, that's uh, how I got my, my training. A salmon feast um, is held down in Okanagan Falls, but um, I know for a fact that um, a long time ago when my grandfather was still alive, they used to have it wherever the fishing was. And they had it, it came up here uh, on Shushwap River. They had their feast there because there was enough of them that came there. And if they went to another river where they fished, and got an abundance of fish, they would honor a salmon feast as you honor the salmon. You go from this place to that place, everybody, you know, so it could be maybe while a bunch of them are over here, you know, having a salmon feast and, and um, another bunch over maybe Columbia River, Kettle Falls, you know, wherever, Okanagan River, you know, it's, it uh, could be anywhere. And all, all of this is like, okay, you know, you don't take the bones and throw them away. You take the bones and, and whatever, you take it back to the water, you give it back to the water. You honor, you pay for it. Awesome tobacco here. When you come up next year, it'll be lots that we honor you. I'm really glad that I was able to get a, a paddle and I'm, I'm, I treasure it and uh, one of these days I'll put it up in my house. Right now it's put away like, you know, and I treasure it, something that I can look back to. So, you know, I worked for it, okay. You know, it was hard work. The culture, I meet people, sit there and we talk. You know, we use the old Okanagan. I had one girl where she could talk me under. You didn't learn that language to be greedy. That's not what they teach you in that. They taught you the language as thinking you're going to help other people. I'm not thinking I'm better than you, but I had to show you. You didn't know all your language, old Okanagan. That's what I used. <laughs> R 
Roxanne is recognized by her community as a strong leader with a powerful voice. She has consistently fought to maintain and teach Okanagan culture and traditional practice, as well as political equality for women in her community. She places great emphasis on the importance of the Okanagan language and is the carrier of the knowledge of Indigenous plants and medicines. Roxanne is strongly connected to the land and as an artist helped to create an educational bundle based on the theme of Nahahait, the lake serpent that resides in Okanagan Lake. To Roxanne, the lake serpent has become a metaphor for sustainability with the understanding that if the lake is compromised and the serpent disappears, the lake's ability to nourish all will also disappear affecting not only West Bank First Nation people, but all those who use the lake. There are two defining and opposing qualities to Roxanne's persona, as there are with her mother. One is that of a compassionate and humble teacher. The other is of a powerful, assertive Aboriginal woman. Combined, these qualities have defined her and have guided her life's journey. One of the most important cultural teachings I, I think I would have received would have been from my mother. Um, as you know, within our culture, we, we have a lot of protocols. And even though my dad was a chief and he was a very powerful man, when it came to us, us women, he backed off because he knew that was the role of mom. It was her responsibility to take us as, as young women and give us those teachings, uh, tell us those things, teach us those things and stuff like that. Um, really very, very important. I, I look at mom now and, you know, she's an elder and I look back and, and I look at, I think about her life. Um, and I try and separate that. That's my mother I'm looking at. I, I look at her, the life that she had. Um, she didn't go to residential school, so she, she had a lot of real purity about her as far as, as cultural teachings. Um, she was very connected to the elders because she wasn't away from September till June in the residential school. She was here in the community. Um, I look at that and I, I think about those teachings and some of the things are just running through my head um, that she had taught us and and that's so important because when you look at it I do believe that uh, our Silk people were matriarchal and there was a huge level of responsibility that that our women carried uh, traditionally and a lot of them still carry today and everything from what I've been taught about our culture was based on respect so there's nothing wrong with that. You know, respect for the land, respect for people, respect for the air, respect for the fish, the birds, the plants, you know, the animals, those food sources. I think that it's important that, that as BC celebrates its 150th birthday, that we celebrate that we still have those teachings because it's those teachings that are going to um, that are going to make sure that when BC celebrates its 300th birthday that I'm hoping that my grandchildren, great-grandchildren will be sitting here saying this is what she said and this is what she did and this is what we saw and this is what's right. You know as a kid you grow up and you hear about the United Nations and how they care about this country and they care about women's issues and they care about children. Well, I had always thought about the United Nations and wondered what it was and, and it was a few years ago I actually had an opportunity to go down to the United Nations and I went down there representing my nation, my people, the Sioux people and, and 
That was just one of the most amazing experiences to sit in that big fancy boardroom and to look around the world, to look around the room and you see people from all over the world. Remember that Maasai Mary, that really tall woman? So indigenous peoples came from all over the world and we sat and, and we shared and, and that was such an honor. I, I never would have thought ever, ever in my life ever that I, I would have ever ended up. Um, some place like that. But one of the most beautiful things that I think I was ever involved in down at the United Nations was, uh, was a water ceremony. And it certainly wasn't my intention uh, to go down there and lead the water ceremony. I was willing to go down and participate and a very dear friend of mine, Tismal Crow, we were to meet him down there. He was a uh, an Aboriginal man from down the United States, a healer, um, had unbelievable plant knowledge and really just quite a dear man. We were to meet him uh, down at the United Nations and he ended up passing away. Um, and I was a little leery about going down there because I thought, oh my goodness, like Tismal shoes, that's going to be hard to fit because Tismal had been interacting with this group of Indigenous people. so. He had opened the door and held that door open even while he was in the spirit world. So to go down to Yellow Springs and do the water ceremony was really very, oh, it was just unbelievable. The feeling that I had, uh, the group that, that was there with us, natives, non-natives, Americans, Canadians. Uh, we had indigenous people, again, from you know different parts of the world. And when we gathered there, um, it was just most, the most amazing because what I had done is in our nation we have Spotted Lake, uh, which is down in the southern part of the nation. So I had taken water from Spotted Lake down there into the water ceremony and I talked to, you know, my mom and other people about, uh, about this water ceremony because um, it was something, you know, that I was still learning about. And again, it's those responsibilities. So, you know, we took water down there. There were offerings that were made and, um, you know, people brought in water from other parts of the world. And, and when you look at that again, it was, it was really reassuring to myself and my being that down there, the water, the, the springs were very sacred. The water was important, so to go down there and to acknowledge the importance of that water with other indigenous people of the world is, is something that, well, that only the Creator could pull together. And, and when I look at that and I think about that, I, that, that gives me power, you know, as an individual, knowing that, knowing that that connection is there to the spirit world. We had an opportunity as, as Okanagan people and as Okanagan artists to, to do a collaboration with the Kelowna Art Gallery. And, you know, we, we thought about what we were going to do and we knew that it was important to bring one of those old teachings forward about the land is the culture, well, the water is the culture as well. So we looked at what people call Ogopogo, what if all these Kelowna residents, BC residents, Canadian residents, everybody knew that there was Ogopogo in the lake. And to us, you know, we always looked at that. And when we were kids, we were told stories about Nakaha Eid and what this, uh, what this being meant, it was a, a water spirit and it was important to us and it was there right, for, right from the beginning of time and it was a part of us and you know all through those childhood stories it was something that we needed to respect and by respecting the we would be respecting the water so it was really quite a beautiful teaching, a wonderful value to carry through from childhood right into adulthood. We wanted to reclaim it wasn't Ogopogo anymore, it wasn't something that was about commercial tourism or seasonal tourism or anything like that. We wanted to share with BC, with Canada, with the world that this sacred being in the water was still very sacred and very important to us even today, even after how many years of contact, that spirit in the water was very much a part of my spirit. A, a, 
was the spirit of my people. Maybe when BC celebrates its 300th birthday, that may be when we talk about the water or whoever's here to talk about the water will, will probably have a much sadder story than I will and will have sadder feelings. And maybe they can only stand there and look at the water with their children and really not go in. And, and I think about that and, and that scares me. When I was a kid, Mom and Dad had always talked about development of land. Dad knew that it was times were going to change. He honestly believed that it wasn't going to happen in his life, but he said it'll either happen in your life or your children's life. But development will come along and I want you to handle it in the most proper manner. We, we started looking um, outside of the community. Um, away from the community because what we had wanted to do was to br provide uh, that haven, that haven maybe that I had when I was a kid. Um, I wanted to be able to do that for my children, for my grandchildren, for my parents, you know, um, even for myself. There was a bit of sadness, but you know, when, when we got out here and we experienced that peace, and we experienced the quiet. Um, we experienced that rich, beautiful, I call it Cherryville pop, but it's water. You know, when we got out here and we started feeling that and living that and breathing that, and it, it just took, took me right back to childhood. And when I go out there now, I love the land and I love the trees. I love everything that we have here. Um, it, it gives me that real, almost a wholesome feeling of, of what I had with it as a child. And out here I know that I am connected to the land. I know that there's a reason I'm here. I know that there's all sorts of food sources, medicines. There's elk that go right through the back of the property here. So I know that I know that this is where I belong and I know that that I can tell my kids and my grandkids when we're out walking that the land is the culture. I know that where I am here, I'm on the northernmost uh, border of our territory as Silk people. And for me, that's good enough. So I, I feel good. I feel wonderful that I, I uh, don't have to live on the reserve. I don't feel strangeness or displacement about leaving it because I know that, that up here where we are, I know that my ancestors were here. And I know that up at Sugar Lake, I know there's recorded archeological sites. That was part of my bunch. Mom grew up over the mountain, that mountain right there, she grew up on North Fork Road, what they call North Fork Road. So for mom to be here, for, for her it's like coming home, I think. And I think that, you know, when she goes out and she drives around, I think that she sees those landmarks and those mountains and she sees Cherry Creek and she knows that that's part of her. That was part of her when she was a child that never left her. You know, um, we're the only native people up here in the community. Um, we take the grandkids out, we've walked the property. We've got 140 acres to walk with them and teach them. You know, we've showed them the mushrooms. There's a dozen different types of mushrooms here all of them edible, you know. Um, we've got to go out and harvest huckleberries with them. Showing my kids and my grandkids and teaching them and taking them out and, and letting them feel that the land is the culture, because it is. So you look at sort of the link from, you know, the grandmother to the daughter to the granddaughter to the great-granddaughter, you're looking at four generations of women just within my family and, and that's something else that we can be celebrating and be extremely proud of is that we have that link to the past. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so fortunate that, that my mother is still there and I'm so fortunate that she's such a knowledgeable, very well respected woman. I'm fortunate and so grateful that she's a language speaker. I'm so grateful that she knows those old coyote stories and I'm grateful that she's told me, and I, I feel really good that those teachings are shared now with the grandchildren. When you look at something like that and, and the, the continuous 
ongoing dialogue that that's taken place through four generations so you know you look at it and people have always talked and made remarks about Okanagan women so I can look at it and I can say yes I know Okanagan women very strong very very proud women and I can look right from my mother to myself to my daughter to my granddaughter and I see that strength and that strength has to be celebrated and and I can't wait till like I'm a great grandma you know <laughs> because again it's that continuance and and I can look to mom and, and there's my past, there's my roots, there's my grounding, there's my values. And I look to my granddaughter and that's my future. And I want to make sure that, that that future is promising, that it's stable, that it's very well grounded. Because I think that when my granddaughter becomes a young woman, I think things are going to be very different. And I think that what's going to make a difference for her are those solid cultural values. Elizabeth and Roxanne believe that many of the teachings drawn from Okanagan culture were meant to be shared for the good of all people, and that while the residue of colonialism has prevented this from happening in the past, the future lies in overcoming such barriers. They are proud of their people. They are proud of the roles they've played in their community and in maintaining a link to their past. They shared their stories and teachings openly and freely with the hope that as all of us, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, move to the future, we move together with a respect for one another that overcomes cultural barriers and racism. Their stories add to the historical record of British Columbia by presenting a voice that has been silenced in the past. This is something to celebrate.